We're going to begin. Welcome to, I actually don't really remember the title of this plenary. It's uh, Patient-Oriented Research and EDI, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, Challenges and Opportunities, something very close to those words. Um, <laughs> welcome, my name is Amber Huey. I come here today in my role as Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Lead at the BC Support Unit. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional ancestral lands of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish peoples where we are gathered, lands that were stolen by the genocide of indigenous peoples. I also want to acknowledge the foundations of systemic oppression that our present health care and health research system has been built on, where black, indigenous, queer, disabled, and bodies of color have been subject to mistreatment, trauma, exploitation, and abuse. I want to start there because I'm grateful for us to be in a zeitgeist where we no longer have to prove that those things are true. Uh, the paradigm has been shifted, and now we get to do the real work together. So I wanted to ask the audience to do something with me. And this worked a little bit better in my mind because yesterday I went to a meeting where there was name tags that you write on and then you stick to your body. And I realized in the act of doing it, I, as a right-handed person, this is not true for everyone, tend to put it on my left-hand side, which is conveniently, or maybe on purpose, right over your heart. So isn't it nice that your name in your introduction to other people is also a portal to your heart. I wanna ask you to take your hand and hold it to your name or your heart, and then give it a little bit of breath, a little bit of energy, and then bring your hands together to welcome our three esteemed guests here today. Thank you, everyone. Um, we're so lucky to welcome Lydia Joy Marshall, Harlan Pruden, and Aaron Mahalik to speak with us today. Uh, starting with Lydia Joy, we're gonna go down the, the chairs, um, and they're each gonna take a couple of minutes to introduce themselves uh, to the room and share with you um, how they're coming into this conversation about equity, diversity, and inclusion. Okay, so I was told this would come on its own. Can we all hear? Good afternoon. Okay, that was a, we need a response, Hello. this is how, good afternoon. <laughs> you've, you've eaten, so there's no excuse for silence. Um, so I am Lydia Joy Marshall. Um, I'm visiting from Treaty 19, the Mississaugas of the Credit, otherwise known to as Toronto, for those. <laughs> yeah, um, I know we were saying that some people think we're the center of the country, I know that we are not, so I humbly am here as part of the conversation. Um, how do I enter this from very many positionalities? Um, but it's always interesting for me as uh, I'm coming as a stolen person on stolen land. And so, you know, how do we reconcile that? That's how I come to this work. So a lot of my work, because my positionality is very visible, I appear as a, a black woman in research. My background is in human genetics and I've done a lot of work in organ donation, which many of my friends here from Ken solve. Um, I've done work with them. And so throughout my research career and my lived experience, I'm witnessing and experiencing the many disparities, especially in my community. And so I come to this work out of necessity, not necessarily out of choice. Um, I thought I was gonna be a nice little lab scientist behind my lab bench and not have to speak to people. Um, apparently that's not the path that was chosen for me. So um, now I do work, I sit as the president of Black Health Alliance where we try to dismantle some of the systemic reasons for the gaps that we see in our communities and how do we really look at that from, from that lens as opposed to our individual relations, how can we dismantle what's happened and do better. So that's me, thank you. Uh, Harlan Pruden, Egwa Wakanomani, Nikasan. Nihak Nihau Nihak Ayakwe, Kenanaskum Tinawawa, Musqueam, Squamish, and Slewatooth Nihau. Greetings, my relatives. My government name is Harlan Pruden. My tradition, I actually use the Indian, the I word, Indian. My Indian name is uh, actually in Sioux. It was, uh, it was gifted to me uh, when I was doing some two spirit work on the uh, Rosebud Reservation. It's a really complex name. I wish that it was like Buffalo Running Sky Woman or something, right? <laughs> and I'm always envious of those folks that have those beautiful names. Mine is Waka no Mani. Waka being spirit, good spirit, bad spirit, neutral spirit. You know, I can do good just as well as I can do bad. 
Okay, I do that sometimes. Or the worst is for me to suck up a lot of space and do nothing. And so that part of my name is how do I want to show up? And I try to show up with good words, good actions, and good thoughts. And when I fall short of that intention, a mistake or a misstep is only a mistake or a misstep if we don't learn from it. Like we didn't learn to walk without falling. We must fall before we can walk. Um, Nome is two and Mani is a sacred journey. Um, and so I was going to get that translated into Cree. I am First Nations Cree. My mother was a member of the Beaver Lake Indian Reserve, and when she married my father, her band registry went to Saddle Lake. I'm a member of Saddle Lake Indian Reserve, two signatories to Treaty 6 territory. And I'm also two-spirit. And I said that in my own language. Um, and I also just give thanks to my host, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, because this is not my territory. And when I moved here from New York, um, I approached all three protocol offices and asked if I could be called ashore metaphorically. And so I can say that I'm a guest. I hear people say I'm an uninvited guest. I don't understand that. <laughs> Either you're a guest or you're not, right? Um, but I am a guest. And the land acknowledgement is, and it speaks to this panel, is you know me being in good relations with those, my hosts. If I and I try to carry that throughout how I walk and how I journey. You know, if, and the land acknowledgement is for me to position myself in and as a guest on the Coast Salish people's territory and land, and I'm very humbled by that. If I didn't do that land acknowledgement and carried myself in an unhonorable way, it would be like me walking into your house or your home and one not acknowledging that I'm in here. I'm, I'm an uninvited guest. <laughs> and then if we carry that analogy forward, I'd start telling you how and what to do in your own home. So that's not what I want to do. It's always of like being in good relations with my host and carrying myself as a guest. And if I don't do that, I run the risk that my hosts and folks that I would, if I were in your house, I run the risk that people will think shitty things of Harlan, but worse, they will make some discernments about my people and who I represent, my Cree people, my Nehyao. And so I try to show up as an ambassador for my people. And so that's what I would like to own when I do that land acknowledgement, my ambassadorship, and how I try to carry myself as a guest in and on the Coast Salish peoples. And so I work at the BC Center for Disease Control. So it would be cooler if I just said, Buffalo, run, <laughs> Buffalo Sky Running Woman, right? <laughs> That's all in my name, and I try to bring uh, honor to my Sioux name and to those that gave me that name. Um, I work at the BC Center for Disease Control for a, um, a program called Chimamuk, and I'm also, um, it's an indigenous health program, and I'm also one of the co-founders of the uh, Two-Spirit Two -Spirit Dry Lab which is one of Turtle Island's first ever research group that solely focuses on two-spirit people, communities, and experiences. But a part of that is how do we do research? And how do we do quantitative research? We do do qual work, but most of it is uh, quant. Um, in which that it's not damage-centered and where we're bringing honor to our indigenous people. And so, and so a part of all of that is these wieldy concepts of equity, inclusion, diversity, or what I would like to say is dignity, belonging, and being in good relations. And so a lot of our work is we're a lab of reconciliation, of trying to work out better relations amongst lab members, but also in those that we sit in community with, or what you would say is the, the researched. Um, but we try to do being right with oneself, right with one lab members, but right with community. And so there's one conversation, and that's what I would like to bring. It is an honor to share space with you all. I love your middle name. I'm going to change. How do I get joy into my name? Because <laughs> that is so beautiful that you can say joy as your name. That is what I would like to bring also. So, a formal thank you in Cree. So thank you. Hi, hi. You just exude joy naturally, <laughs> don't you? <laughs>
I'm Erin Mahalik, and uh, it's wonderful to see so many uh, friends and well-known faces in the audience and people I've yet to get to know. Um, when I was 16, I met my father for the first time. I was carrying his name at that point, Wallace, and uh, did not like him. He did not like me, and at that point, I changed my name to my grandfather's Polish name, Mahalik, and I'm incredibly proud to still carry it today and I think he would be proud if he were here seeing the work that we're doing together. Um, I'm a professor in psychiatry at UBC um, but I want to begin by saying you know in terms of my own experiences with mental health conditions I've been fairly lightly touched. Uh, the worst I experience is sometimes my anxiety gets so bad that I feel like it's going to eat me alive and last week was like that um, and I was worried and not sleeping and then I had the opportunity over the weekend where I live in Huesam, Roberts Creek on the Sunshine Coast, a short ferry ride away from here and I had the chance uh, for several hours to get out into the local forest and to grub around foraging for mushrooms and in doing so and putting my fingers into the soil and stopping to smell um, to kneel essentially on on those lands, you know, it was such a, a good reminder that everything I need and get uh, spiritually, emotionally, physically, in terms of my nutrition, is an honor to come from those lands and uh, the Coast Salish peoples um, that they're held by. So, uh, with that, you know, I position my experiences, you know, as a patient in in the system, um, and they shape everything in terms of the way I see the system but also my work as equity and inclusion uh, champion at the BC support unit. I actually don't like the word champion. I prefer it to be kind of champette because I work with such incredible people at the support unit, including Amber, and it's uh, really collective work to be done. So I look forward to this conversation together today. Oh, that is... Thank you so much, everyone, for bringing so much of yourself to this space. Um, I already feel really good. Um, and so thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we have collectively come up with a few questions to discuss together. Um, and then we'll open up to questions from the audience, um, from the virtual and the physical room. So I'll try to finagle my, my devices here um, during our time together. So please feel free to drop the questions into the Q&A. Shout out to the introverts in the audience who don't like coming up to the micro microphone. I'm one of those people. Definitely use the Q&A in the app. It is helpful. Upvote um, uh, the questions that you'd like to see answered. Um, the first question we have is about thinking about how equity and diversity and inclusion is not new. Um, but why is it sort of treated now as a novel and trending thing? Um, and following from that, how then do we move from EDI as a novel and trending idea in mainstream research to basic best practice? Um, in other words, how do we bake in EDI in patient-oriented research? I'm gonna, yeah, go with the person that's looking at me. <laughs> Um, you know, we could give a simple answer. Is it popular because of TikTok, like social media? Um, I think it's, it's now visible to those it, it wasn't impacting before. So it's not new to any of us who were already marginalized, or this was our life, or this is what we've been fighting for. But now it's something that has become visible, that's become funded. Um, I think that's a big incentive as to a lot of people, we often call them equity tourists, who now are saying, you know, this is, in, this is part of what you need to be funded. Um, you know, I, I don't want to say it only negatively. There's people who also have become aware. Maybe that's also great how they're entering the conversation. But I think how we need to make it stay is that it has to become a basic and fundamental part of work as opposed to this icing nice thing to have. Um, what I see a lot in my work is like, you know, you'll do the first four steps of whatever the research project is and then go, oh, let's check in with the people or let's, you know, this is a little thing after a nice to have as opposed to a basic best practice. Um, and so I think it needs to change by who or who's setting the steps, who's there and who is present, and how it's seen that it is really something that's fundamental. I think it's not just uh, a shift in the steps. We have to realize that a lot of our research practices are born out of oppression. They are born and weren't made for the diversity and inclusion that we're saying that we want. Um, it's, it's purposely set up so, right? It's not just that it happened to come this way and now we're going to shift it. Um, and I, I think about 
my experiences with REB. For any of those who are there right now, I'll be friends with you one day, but that is not today. And my experiences always are that, you know, the language of ethics and research is always speaking of us as others. I'll be applying for research grants and they'll be like, well, what if you're going to do harm in that community? And I'm like, did you ever assume that the researcher would be from the community? Never. And so how is it that we make change is that we start shifting our language, our thought, that inclusion starts with those of us who are setting the policies. We often look outwards and think about you know, how do we protect patients or the different words we've heard today, our patients, our participants. But I think the change has to start with us as researchers and realizing that our environment right now is not inclusive. I walk into too many rooms where I'm the only one. I'm representing multiple and diverse communities that I myself am learning about, but because we are the same melanation, um, I'm expected to represent them. And I, and I think that's where it has to change. So it has to be a true inclusion at every step and something that is seen as a fundamental. Thank you. I really like that phrase, equity tourists. Um, this is not a new topic. <clears throat> and it's definitely not a new topic for someone like myself who is indigenous, First Nations, who is also gay and you know, or two-spirit, and the sexual and or gender. And I really love that, that we, I've had to do, um, because it was an act of survival. And that within research, in the research ecosystem, it is not only colonial, and with much intentionality it has been set up, like, to exclude me, me, and those like me, other indigenous, two-spirit, and or gender and sexually diverse folks. Or when we were included, it was not in a good way. You know, like Tisdale, like Frederick Tisdale and Moore, who went to six residential schools in the 50s and basically starved indigenous children to death to find out what was the minimum caloric value to sustain life. And then from those teachings, we built the Canadian Food Guide. And in many respects, you know, research that we must, the part of reconciliation of the reconciling is knowing this history. That often research has been a tool or a handmaiden of colonization. But I'm a researcher and I also work for the BC government. Like I'm the man, <laughs> like <laughs> metaphorically man, okay? <laughs> um, and so, it is how do we get in good relations? And research, I believe, is one aspect that we can do that. Research, and you know, for the Two-Spirit Dry Lab, we have about 40 members. And we, yes, we're a lab of reconciliation, but we're also a lab of love. And you all could be a lab of love. And you're like, wait a minute, this is a professional setting. I'm a researcher. What does love have to do with this, right? Maybe love is a little too much of a a concept to bite off, right? But you are given an opportunity, just like I am, as well as the Two-Spirit Dry Lab, is to do research that is mindful of trust and engenders trust. And how the placeholder of that is, you know, being in respectful relations with yourself and with one another, and letting that emanate out. So if love is too much, <laughs> tuck it away in your pocket and say, mm, how do I increase trust and being in mindful and good relations? And as a result of that, meeting community where community is. Because we are literally at a crisis of trust. Like, we had to go in lockdown twice at BCCDC because the anti-vaxxers and the anti-maskers didn't trust what we were doing. Or when I go into community and we were doing a focus group with indigenous communities and we heard how they did not trust us. Because they're saying that we are not in good relations. And so I think for EDI, we can talk about EDI, but really I wanna go to the heart of what we are talking about. Being in mindful and good relationships, then the possibility for trust, and once you have trust and good relations, guess what you have? Love. 
you literally can operationalize love in a research setting. But that doesn't mean setting up advisory boards. Because I can say, Joy, those are nice earrings, but maybe you know, they should have a little color. That's advice. Where what you should be doing is, if you want to engage with community, let them come to the table and help you inform the work, your research question. And when they see themselves a part of something, guess what you have? Trust and good relations, and you have the possibility for love. And I think that's how we start to have to think about research in a different way, about relationships and being mindful of relationships. And that, I think, is a best practice, a best practice of love. And all of those little things that we have been like struggling with will kind of take a second seat if that's how you try to walk into the world. So I'll riff a little bit off this um, great conversation that's evolving around, around trust, because there's a lot of trust in this, in this room, right? This is a pretty safe, space. In fact, I was at a conference in Toronto, a patient engagement conference last week, and one of the metaphors there was find your people, find your village, find people that share similar values to you. And this is that, right? That many of us in this room, or the people we're collaborating with, um, are, are, you know, hold similar values and trust and are fond of each other. And, you know, many people in this room will um, embody the knowledge that you know our health interventions are not being co-designed with people with lived experience sufficiently. They're not being evaluated by the people who are using them. Clinical trials aren't including samples that are diverse enough. And even if they are, it's hard to pull the data from it in a way that where you can tell what the outcomes are for people who walk different walks of life. So that's the fuzzy, cozy side of it. The other part of trust or lack of it is the piece around the very real potential that um, if we are pushing health researchers who don't really value this to somehow embed EDI principles and practices in work that they are not mature enough or ready for or capacity built or skilled enough in yet that they hold the potential to do real damage and harm. Mm -hmm. And so let, I would enjoy carrying that piece of the conversation forward through this panel in terms, in terms of thinking how, how can we support practices that are culturally competent, emotionally, psychologically mature in a way where we don't do damage, but we help flourish and build systems of, of love and respect. Thank you so much, every, everyone. I, I really, yeah, it, it's about thinking about how we can be more trustworthy as a system. What are we doing to show that we can earn trust, I think, from communities? Um, but I also think, I went to this international KT conference in Miami. Okay, let me say that again. In Miami, come on, <laughs> in February. <laughs> I was like, how do I get on this conference planning committee? Um, but I just remember um, there was this panel and there was this, uh, there was this uh, individual that just got tenure. And how they began their talk, they were saying, all research is biased. And let's start there. Let's, let's actually have a truth saying, because I know that often within research and the way that we're taught within our schools is, is that the numbers are cold, <laughs> they're rational, <laughs> they're not. All research, and especially when you uh, prioritize one system, a Western system over and a discounting and a dismissal or the erasure of indigenous knowledge, right? But it, this individual, just like shared that, but they also shared about how they were doing, they just got their tenure track and they weren't slagging tenure. But I don't even know how they did this methodology, but they wanted to go back retrospectively to see what did their research and how did their, imp their research impact policy and program, like world. And they found that their research did nothing. <laughs> that they were just publishing for you all, <laughs> like other researchers and other academics, right? That is a, that we are at a crux of do we want to keep on replicating the system in which that we're only talking and not actually doing good in the world? And I think this conversation around not only EDI but getting in good relations and doing good and having work that is informed by love 
you will know that your work is landing because those folks that you sit in relations will uptake what you're taking, you're putting down, because they will be a part of that. And I think that's where we have to start critically, but just more like emotionally, <laughs> maturely, bringing a conversation because research is not unfree of bias. And I think we have to be really honest with ourselves. Um, absolutely. One, one refrain that we hear a lot about and something we all know about patient-oriented research is how it doesn't reflect the diversity of our population. Um, the, the wow, um, it, <laughs> I like the wow, but I'm a cow, <laughs> so I have something to say as a Chinese woman. <laughs> I don't know if I like it so much. Anyways, an impulse to increase diversity has been to simply invite more people from certain identity categories into research spaces. Um, so how do you handle, respond, and then feel about situations where you, where you see people you're working with or you're supporting people who you, you know are working tokenistically um, in patient-oriented research. And so by tokenistic, we mean folks might be brought into research settings um, to tick off that checkbox, uh, to say that they've done engagement but aren't necessarily listening to, respecting, or actioning any of the contributions from that person. I can start. Um, if you think you don't like wow, think about me. I'm a bow, which I will not do. <laughs> um, so I think, uh, you know, this one is something that I've experienced so often when I sit now in my community researcher seat. So I've purposely come out of institutional research because I felt that it was not possible for me to represent my community and do that work within structures that were not made for me. And we are often invited to, oh, we're doing work in black community and they approach it like some National Geographic study, like we're going to watch the people. <laughs> and, you know, we're brought into these spaces and I'm just like, this is not safe. And I'll either, I'll be the one there or I'll see other people in the, the position. And I remember, you know, really early in my research, one of my mentors said to never go alone. It doesn't matter if it's one person in, in this institution who has invited you, do not go alone. And whether that is physically or you know you have a group of like-minded people to be able to decompress and deconstruct what's happening. And I think this is what I've, I've taken with me. Like none of us can represent a full community. And to have, you know, these advisory boards, as you say, or have these moments after you've done all the steps of your research planning, you've set your research direction, and then say, hey, can you just, you know, sign off on this? It's something that I, I won't do. So now sitting as a community researcher, if we see that you have already applied for the grant, you have allocated the money, you have decided who you are speaking with, you have set the tone, we'll say then you can continue and finish it yourself. Um, we will not participate in it if it is not something that is genuinely in partnership. And I think, you know, it's it's really a matter of personal safety. I've, I've gotten to a point now as a researcher where this will literally take my life. Like I, I remember being in meetings and I'll end research meetings just laying on the floor, like not metaphorically, like physically laying on the floor because what it has taken out of me to carry that weight. And so I advocate for others that you, you cannot go into spaces like this if it has not, the environment hasn't shifted. You know, like I look at us here on this panel and I know some research places I've, I've been in, this would be like a researcher's dream, like yes, yes, we've got one of each, yes, we're good, right? I can't work like that. It's like how have you actually change the environment that we are bringing of ourselves. We're not just contorting ourselves into a place that wants to say that they've brought us there for the optics. And so I think, you know, for me, this like tokenism is out. I mean, we don't, we don't do it anymore. So how do we always come together with people who are like-minded and can support us both physically, financially, spiritually, that this work, that both environments will be shifted. We're doing real work in community and we're doing real work to change the environment of the institutions that we're in. Wow, thank you. Um, okay, my mind reels on this because I was just in a meeting about three weeks ago and uh, in PHSA there's an indigenous like coffee, like every Friday we zoom in, right? And I remember um, uh, someone who was older, an older states person, <laughs> was slamming the checky box Indians. And I was like, pump the brakes. You know, in that 
we have to be thankful for the Checky Box Indians because they were doing all that they could do given the limitations. But today, and on that, that particular meeting, there was like 70 or about 75 indigenous staff members across PHSA. Thank goodness that we had those Checky Box Indians that were just tokenistically <laughs> doing what they were doing because that's all they could do. So that we today, 70 of us could meet and convene and strategize and to figure out how do we get in better relations? How does PHSA, uh, the BC Provincial Health Services Administration, how do we get in better relations and how do we take on the conversation of reconciliation? As I also apply that, yes, tokenism is here. <laughs> And I know that um, I remember having a conversation with someone in my office. If, like, if I were to say that I do not want to work with colonistic, racist, not kind people, I would not leave my office. <laughs> I wouldn't leave my home, right? Um, and so for the checky box Indians, I also must expand that out to all folks, right? And so we have to, and when we, I smell tokenism, but what I do is I just pull those folks closer and enter into that relationship. They will slowly figure it out. But me to foreclose the relationship, I foreclose any possibility of relationships. And for, you know, Sean Wilson writes a lot about this um, in Research's Ceremony, as well as Evelyn Steinhauer from the University of Alberta, who's an actual relative. But for my Cree ontology is, is that all knowledge is relational. Without relationships, there is no possibility of knowledge. And what I'm saying there is you can have a cure for cancer, but if you have no network to share that knowledge or you use such inaccessible language that no one understands what the heck you're saying, do you have a cure for cancer? The answer is no. So why don't we lean into the relationship? So to all my Chicky Box Indians from way ago, I thank them. For the folks that are teaching and are not where they are, that are being colonistic, that are not being kind, i.e. racist, and or being tokenistic, I lean into that relationship. And that's a difficult pill. But it is also in which how I've conducted myself within this agency, but also conducted myself in the way that I work in the world and once they start seeing Harlan for Harlan, Harlan as a person, Harlan for my humanity and humanity, they will change because they must. And so that's why I do what I do and how I do it. And again, it's out of love. And so I must embody that. And sometimes I just want to grind those folks to sawdust. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't. Um, but just know that we are being incredibly kind, right? And so I have a bigger, like, teaching around that I can share with you about that. And really, real quickly, and it was a teaching that was given to me by Wab Canoe. Yay, Wab Canoe! <laughs> <clears throat> when he was in um, Vancouver a couple of years ago, I had dinner with him. And what he shared so eloquently is, is that when Christopher Columbus, you know, it is October for a couple more days, when Christopher Columbus happened upon the shores of the indigenous peoples of the greater Antilles. He was sung to shore and welcome to this territory. because Those are our protocols. And in 2017, when folks, when we, Canada took in 70,000 Syrians that were fleeing from a global humanitarian crisis, I will not call them refugees, because that's a label, they were fleeing a global humanitarian crisis. Canada took in, and I remember going, why are we bringing more people? <laughs> and there were indigenous people that went down to airports and they sang these Syrian folks to this land and welcomed them to this territory. With hands out welcome, they were welcome to this. Because had we not done that, it would have meant that colonization has won and has fundamentally changed who we are. That I don't think colonizers and settlers know that our act and the ultimate act of resistance is, is that we stand in good relations with you all. 
and we're charting a new way forward that's akin to our sacred teachings. So as much as I want to grind those people to sawdust, I have seven sacred teachings of love, kindness, peace, respect, humility, wisdom, truth, that I must respond to them. That's a resistance that is sustainable, but it's also a resistance that we must invoke. And I do that also within a research setting. And I don't think people understand how we're being, how we're resisting. Because two wrongs don't make a right. And I know and I've been thinking about this so much that right now in Canada, given the politics, is that no one can say no to indigenous people. But for me to turn around and treat you all the way that you all have treated me is unsupported. But it also means that I would be condoning that action. So what you're hearing is my knowledge system pushing back of like saying, I'm going to like be rooted and grounded in my sacred teachings and to respond with love and kindness to even of those that are treating us colonistically, tokenistically, and not kind. Because two wrongs don't make a right. And that is such a bitter pill that I have to, but I also happily take that bitter pill because we must chart a new way forward and I must be mindful of that. Do you do like private lessons so I can get a, a private lesson on this right after? You give way too many tangents to run with. That's your problem. <laughs> I, I love the way this panel is evolving and that, you know, it, it's really speaking to one of the tensions that I, I feel in EDI and, and patient-oriented research, which we've already spoken to a bit, you know, the, 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 the contrast between safety, protection, as Lydia Joy said, saying no when you know that's going to be an unsafe space that will have maybe low likelihood of success versus um, leaning in to relationships that are going to be difficult um, and, you know, have a high, uh, be challenging, some of which will fail, um, but knowing that much of the power exists in those people who are doing things in old-fashioned ways with lack of maturity. And that, and that tension between the two is, as an advocate, as an ally of people with lived experience, um, I say no all the time. Um, not so much in, in my BC support unit family work, but you know, in psychiatry a lot. You know, just over the last few months, somebody knocking on my door on a Friday. I've got a trial in psychedelics. I need a patient partner by Monday for something that's illegal. No, no, <laughs> not going to happen. Um, and just personally, in terms of you know, being somebody with a little bit of knowledge in EDI, sometimes you know, I just get pulled into events. I'm like, oh, you were just chick ticking a box with including our team in that, right? You're not ready for change. You're not going to change. You were just, you know, just ticking that box. How does that make me feel? To go back around to where you said, icky, kind of sick inside. Um, and yes, yeah, so I say no a lot, um, but I also endorse. Um, the, uh, but you also have a lot of protection as a person to lean into those relate into that as well. And I don't know that um, that's the same for you know thinking about trauma informed care models and, and safety. Um, that we can't. We're not all in that position to lean in the same way, right? Thank you so much. I, yeah, to, you know, for drawing attention to yeah. Sometimes it does feel icky. Sometimes this is about life and death, and sometimes this is about love. So uh, we really traversed some terrain there with this question. So thank you for, for your, um, your thoughts. Um, we'll do one more question. Uh, and this one's about your biases. How, how do you, as who you are, attend to your own biases, both positive and negative, in your EDI work? Do you want to switch up the order, or you want to? <laughs> I'll focus on positive biases because I think a lot of our training around being more aware of our unconscious biases focuses on the negative stuff, right? And it's really worthwhile as well, you know, A, recognizing like research is all biased, humans are all biased, there's a reason for that, it helps us navigate the world and complex systems. We you know we have schema, we put things in boxes and that helps us make sense of, the, of things. Uh, they're not all healthy or helpful or, you know, constructive. So you do that piece of work around, you know, really, inter you know, recognizing as a person um, where your negative and, and positive biases lie. For, 
for me, I am acutely aware and need to be aware when I'm sitting on review panels that my lean in terms of you know allocating funding to projects will be those that are really focused on marginalized, equity deserving, historically undervalued groups. And that positive bias for me can play out um, very easily um, in terms of assigning research funding. And I need to be aware of that in terms of really, you know, uh, uh, supporting research that you know is um, strongly evidence-based and informed and, and well designed so just balancing the positive and the, neg and the negative and having a you know a menu of strategies being aware of bias is only just the beginning of, of, of the work to be done um, we really need to have in our pockets some strategies for identifying those times when we're make we're more likely to make risky decisions you know when we're stressed or cognitively challenged or threatened or anxious, we're much more likely to fall back on stereotypes and traditional forms of behavior and response. So I spend a lot of time watching for when those, when I'm gonna be at risk of my biases playing out more strongly. Goodness, I just got lost in your <laughs> beautiful um, biases. One is, <clears throat> one of our sacred teachings is humility. Um, and so I try to invoke ours. Like I said, Cree, uh, <laughs> Let me qualify that. And so humility is one of mine as also our sacred teaching. And, um, and so how I try to like manage my own biases is, and to invoke that sense of humility is always like a sense of curiosity. And do I have enough information? and asking questions, but there does come a time when you, you cannot have a life of questions, right? Because then you're like in action, right? Uh, and so there's another tool that I invoke and that's always showing up in a team. And having two or three, like for lab members, we rarely present by ourselves. We always show up with like two or three. And when we do site visits in community, we show up with like up to like five lab members or six, depending on how much we can afford. Um, but then the humility of like, we have trans identified both masculine and feminine and trans masculine and trans men. We have cis presenting, non-binary, white, like German, like blonde, blue eyed white folks in a part of our team. And it's that diversity of thought and making sure that we're all in good relations, but we also have these conversations. So that we're checking each other and constantly checking each other in and I, I know that for a lot of times, you know, for the Two-Spirit Dry Lab and being a Two-Spirit community organizer for the past like 25 years, a lot of times people will defer to me, the leader, the co-founder, right? And rather than stepping into that, of the, this curiosity, but this humility. But in the end, we have to decide. And so we try to do this group consensus or consensus decision-making processes. And there's how we kind of like balance the biases so that not one person gets their way, but we're moving together as one. And so that's how I kind of both positively and negatively is checking that. And for the review panels is the team of like, when I'm like bringing in an indigenous and two-spirit lens, I'm hoping that other people will be bringing in these things, but we put those, I always put those into concert with one another so that we can build a, like a panel and a panel discussion. But again, it's just invoking what does humility as a sacred teaching mean and then operationalizing what humility is. No pressure less. <laughs> Um, I think for me, there's a lot of reflexivity exercises. So I'll always walk into a space and be, you know, where do I hold power here or where am I marginalized? Um, but, you know, both of you kind of have spoken about your own checks and balances. I have definitely been checked externally. Um, and when I was thinking about this, I, I thought about one example where you know, I was asked to do research, you know, as the black researcher, because in all black communities, and I had, um, we went to go meet with a group of these Sudanese aunties. So I am West Indian, I'm from Barbados and Bahamas. So this is like not my culture, but obviously I was the only researcher, right? And so I went, we met with these aunties to talk about what are their experiences in healthcare. Um, we were specifically, again, looking at um, kidney donation and we wanted to, you know, to get to there to see what did they think, what were their experiences. 
And so, you know, in my community, we often will speak about ourselves when we're trying to like encourage each other and be like, you know, I'm a newbie and queen, yay, yay, yay. So I made the mistake of saying this in this group. And one of the aunties very quickly corrected me that she is actually from the Nubian nation. And I am very confused <laughs> about why I would use this. She said it with love, with absolute love. But it was so humbling to say, you know, even in my positive biases, you know, we in trying to reclaim some of our lost identities often want to associate ourselves with what we consider greatness and amazing our Afrocentric histories. But sometimes we ourselves appropriate cultures that are not ours. And so it was such a humbling moment for me to be like something that I say all the time, have I ever researched this? Do I know who these people are? And it kind of put me on my own journey of like actually learning who I was. So I had to go back to my Grammy um, who is Arawak and who is Kalinga from, from the Carib and be like, okay, next time I say this, I have to actually say who my people are instead while I'm still representing these others. So, you know, for me, it was such an example of even in our positive biases, you know, I say this phrase as something that I thought was so complimentary and so amazing, but I was like, how ignorant was that for me to just appropriate a whole culture because I thought it was like cool and on TikTok. Right, um, and <laughs> so I think it's a matter of constant self-reflection. And you know, these aunties they they helped me through the rest of the research project, right to publication, of showing me both their way. Um, and you know, we finally got to the conversations around where we did intersect, which was unfortunately around our experiences in anti-black racism in healthcare. But they were able to show me, you know, how do we learn from each other? How do we check ourselves? And how do we do that continuously? And it was a very early lesson of why I have to always walk into a space, even when I assume it's my community, and think about what do I know, what is truth, what is assumed, and who can I turn to to find out the truth about that. Thank you, everyone. That, that, those are our questions. We have 12 minutes left for um, audience questions. I see some in the chat um, or in the Q&A already. I'm just gonna do a quick scan. Um, okay. So the, the question I'm, I'm seeing here, I, I hear a lot from, um, from people in this work, um, and that's about engaging folks who are hardly reached or equity seeking. So what are your recommendations around engaging folks who are hardly reached or from equity seeking communities in research? Anyone can take this first if they like. I can take it first. Um, I think, in, again, it's the language I always hear there, like how do we reach? How about if we are the researchers, um, we can speak to our own communities. So, you know, it's again looking at who is sitting in what positions and those conversations, not seeing it as others, or who are we reaching? If we are integral parts of the research design and we are also integral parts of community, those voices will be heard. So you don't have to seek out something if you have made it evident for us to be a part of the conversation at all points. I'm actually gonna add on this other question that's very similar. So, and thinking about which marginalized uh, groups might not have the capacity also to participate if they don't have financial staff time, et cetera. That was the answer, the, the finances <laughs> um, have funded work. I think, you know, I don't know everyone else's experience, but I know especially as a community researcher, we are asked over and over to donate our time, our resources, because we are helping our community. Um, so if that is what it is, how do you build capacity? How do you amplify knowledge that is in community? How do we train our youth so that they are also future researchers? How do we value those knowledge keepers who are there now? Often it's the criteria that we define as experts, which is preventing those who could be helping us. Um, and so how do we shift those things and how do we do it with building capacity? You know, I've been in places where um, research will spend more money on their Christmas dinner than they did on community outreach. Yeah. And so how do you shift? That's how you shift it. You shift it by prioritizing and changing with the capacity and how, what you value. Uh, there is a question over there. Um, for myself, when I'm on a review panel, and also I'm a Vancouver Public Library trustee, which I don't know why I'm there. <laughs> I know why I'm there. <laughs> Librarians totally rock. I love librarians. <clears throat> um, but 
I always look at the budget. And with like, with like, just really with a critical eye. I don't like the word critical because it has a bad name. With uh, observations and reflections, deep observations and deep reflections, because really your budget is a statement of value. Like that is where the actual like, and so building into these budgets of like, what is your commitment to community? And I don't uh, the positionality of uh, capacity bridging. It's not what I heard. Sorry, building. It's capacity bridging. And for the Tewsbury Dry Lab, we always take a lens of capacity. There's much capacity within Indigenous communities. Like literally, we're not supposed to be here. Had the colonial project been realized, one, I would not be here as a physical reminder that we're on stolen land. Or two, I would be here and not know my sacred teachings, like Wab said. And so there is plenty of capacity. And so what we do is just build upon the strengths within community and looking to direction from community so they can self-actualize of like, what are the research questions? Who, what do you want us to do? And so that I think is, is like, again, just shifting our lens and our frame from a deficit-based to an asset-based approach. And I know that the lab really tries to work out on that. Um, and so that's how we would respond. Can I just, I, sorry. Um, I was gonna say, I agree with you. When I say capacity building, I don't mean in terms of knowledge. Yeah. I mean in terms of literally yeah, yeah, asking yeah. people to participate when they are working already, when they are doing other things. Like how do you actually make space for people to show up so that their knowledge can be valued? So I agree with you completely. It's a bridge to bring it forward, but yeah. bridge takes a I lot. Know that that's what you, I knew you were not <laughs> saying that. And I don't want to eat into the question time too much, but just to signpost that it was really great to see a shout out from Amy Lang this morning on our tapestry tool project. We have a whole suite of resources for supporting marginalized or hardly reached communities, which are available in one of the rooms at the back developed by the support unit. And we'll drop a link to that into the online chat for online participants too. Thanks, Aaron. Question from the audience. Hi. Is it on? Just talk. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, I don't even know where to start. I hope that I have the chance to, to um, learn more from each of you through the day. My question is around a word that I sometimes hear, but I haven't heard today, which is around accountability. And, and I sometimes hear this in, in particular in conversations um, with Indigenous health researchers in my role at CIHR and with my colleagues who work in Indigenous health research around the importance of um, supporting uh, research that is accountable to community. And I'm curious to know um, if that's something that, if that's a word that you all think about in your work with community. Um, and if so, what are ways that we all can uh, encourage that kind of accountability? Um, and, and, you know, from my perspective as the research funder, uh, budgets seem like a very good example. Are there other examples that you would like to share with us? Um, thank you, Amy. Um, so I think, again, this is just learning for me. I think it's like shifting some of the words that you said. So again, uh, you're saying accountable to community. What I would hope is that the researchers are from community that we are partnered with and so that the accountability is also embedded in the work. So yes, we as researchers from communities who are marginalized um, have to hold it, but it looks different um, than saying we're trying to hold the system accountable to being responsible for us. I think what we want to shift is that the risk, there's a, a different type of partnership where the work is led by community. And so therefore now the accountability is to have a loving relationship. I'm learning, I'm learning. Um, that's where the accountability is instead, that you maintain relations. We're not dropping in, we're not dropping out. The accountability now becomes if we are actually um, working together, if we are actually dependent on one another, that accountability will become because both of us thriving is relying on each other. But I think it starts with having that the researchers are actually from the community, and so therefore it looks different of holding accountable. So I think that term is still relevant, um, but how we spoke about it today is maybe embedded in shifting how we view and who's researching. Okay. I think if you're looking for some like practical tools, the budget and the observations and reflections on the budget. Um, but also I know that for the Two-Spirit Dry Lab, uh, for CIHR, for the Indigenous Gender Wellness Initiative, that was a, a collaboration between um, the Institute for Gender and Health 
the Institute for Indigenous Peoples Wellness and for Population and Public Health. And um, what they offered was a four or five year team building grant. And so, you know, we have a, a half a million dollars to support our work. I think it's a four year grant. Um, and where we're building those relationships with, you know, for Haida Gwaii and Old Masset. And it's a relationship that we've been nurturing for tw since 2018. And when we were there for June, when we hosted the, uh, their uh, Old Masset Two-Spirit um, and LGBTQI plus Pride event, um, we finally got the word in the uh, Old Masset dialect for Two-Spirit. And then we met with elders and we're like, what do we want to do with this word? And they're like, potlatch. I'm not a potlatcher, but it became really clear that any time a word is said three times in potlatch, it's either brought to life or it's rewoken. So they want a reawakening ceremony. Um, and so we're in the process right now of trying to identify somewhere between fifty and $70,000. We're going up in December to do another so line of like community consultations of what do they want at this potlatch, and then we have to go into fundraising mode. Um, that's how, from that example, it's like we're not rolling in and saying, we know what's best for your two-spirit people. We're going to tell you, no, we're meeting with the nannies and the chinnies, the grandmothers and the grandfathers, and saying, where do we begin the work and how do we begin the conversation? And in that respect, we baked right into that levels of accountability. But that's because we have a team-building grant. And I think that you have to like vest that those relationships, if we are wanting to saying that all knowledge is relational, we can't just go straight to operations. That we must build because that's when you, like when you start truncating those relationships, that's when it becomes checky box and it becomes very tokenistic. And we're given a really long runway, four years to build. And that's it's the same work that we're doing in Northern California with the Hoopa, Kurok, Yurok, and Wiat people around Two-Spirit Health Research. Um, and we're like building this network, but we're given the time to construct those. And so they're, they're all based on love, but they're incredibly accountable because it's our names and our street cred within those communities. And so we can't do harm. Um, and so I think it's baked right into that system. So I think for CIHR is, is that for indigenous research, but all research, it should have a component in which that may be a, an investment of like one year to build relationships, meet with the elders, meet with your community leaders, find out what they want to do, then go to the research. Uh, so, so agree with that, but to add on to it too, um, those pieces in, oh, so you've built your team and you've, you've, built, you've built the system and you have that community engagement, which is so precious, and then to lose it between, because of funding restrictions or just t funding tightness between classic tri-council epochs of funding, that is such, accountability is very hard to provide in terms of making sure you have a legacy of how that data is handled, sharing the knowledge back with community, but most importantly, you have these wonderful relationships and the chance to sustain them as you move on to your next piece of funding. That for me is the greatest barrier as a health researcher in terms of, and we always find a, ma a way to make it work, but that's one of the things that keeps me awake at night again and again is how, how can I sustain that in between, yeah. We have one minute left and I was told I was not allowed to go over, but we do have one question that is, has been the most upvoted question. So in one word, yes or no, or in 10 seconds or less, is digital health increasing the gap between the underserved and general population? Is digital health increasing the gap between the underserved and the and mainstream and general population? Sometimes. Depends. Sometimes. <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, everyone, for, for your time. This was, um, thank you. Thank you all for being here and bringing your whole selves as well. Um, I was told to also make a plug for the exhibitors out in the that room over there in the corner. Um, you can check out the tapestry tool that Aaron mentioned. Um, we have 10 minutes to get to our next session. Another round for our speakers. <laughs>